How do I find the right keywords for my book? Or how do I even start writing a book in the first place? These questions and more are answered in the new Chapter One podcast, Ask Me Anything video series, available on YouTube. In these videos, I'm going to be answering your literary questions about media, marketing, publishing, and technology. So think about anything you've ever wanted to know about writing, publishing, and promoting a book, and then send those questions to info at ch1podcast.com. To access these videos, just click the link in the show notes or search for Chapter One Podcast on YouTube. And now, on to the show. Hi, this is Steve Rogers, and I'm the author of City of Shards. City of Shards is an epic fantasy centered around a boy named Laren who lives in the fantasy equivalent of the inner city slums, a neighborhood known as the Wormpile District. He lives there with his drug-addicted warrior uncle, a man named Akul with a mysterious past and emotional range of granite. Laren's central problem is his Tourette-like outbursts, in which he shouts an unintelligible three-word phrase. This phrase is in a language he doesn't know, though as we find out later, some people know very well what it means. Those outbursts have turned him into a pariah in the Wormpile district, and he's taunted regularly by the gang. He's saved from the worst beatings by his uncle Akul, who's better with a sword than most people are with silverware, and who has carved out a four-block district where no gang member dares to tread. But Laren is stuck in those four blocks, lonely and terrified, and yearning to find out what is behind his outburst. Early in the book, we find out that Laren's outbursts come from a creature named Haraf, who is an ancient being some have called Lord of Demons. Laren's phrase has marked him as Haraf's servant, and we soon find that as bad as Haraf is, a far greater threat is looming on the horizon from the six-legged god, who are Haraf's enemy. Most of the rest of the book follows Laren's life as he fights the six-legged gods while struggling to reconcile just who his master Haraf really is and how he can fight one evil while supposedly serving another. While Laren is the main POV character, the book also follows the royal family of Tanbar, the empire in which Laren lives, as it comes under increasing threat from the forces of the six-legged god. And it also follows the life of Kemharak, a non-human member of the indigen class of creatures who were here before humanity came. Kemharak is a general who is determined to steal back from the humans what he feels was stolen from him. City of Shards and Book Two of the Spellgiver series weave these three plot lines together into a resolution of immense scope. If I had to put the Spellgiver series into a nutshell, I would say it is a story of redemption. Redemption for an outcast boy coming into burgeoning power who must choose a third path between two evils. Redemption for a permanently drunk priestess who finds love amid endless war and redemption for a scaly, four-armed general who fights his gods and his people to live alongside the two-armed creatures who have invaded his world. Book lovers unite! I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to The Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. In each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. Hey, everybody. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Steve Rogers, the author of City of Shards. Yeah, if you love fantasy, then you're going to really, really, really love this book because it has everything in it that you can possibly imagine possibly want. It's got the hero's journey, of course. It has magic, politics. It's multifaceted and intricate. We really dive into this novel. And Steve has done an amazing job of not only building this world of Spellgiver, but building the entire universe Both book one and book two of this series are already out. So you read one, you're definitely going to want the other. I love fantasy, so I feel like I'm just rambling. I'm going to to stop right now, okay? Steve Rogers, City of Shards, starts right now. Begin chapter one. The day Laren first exploded was one of flint skies and a fog that mercifully shrouded the worm pile's trash-filled alley. A dark layer of soot and vaporized goose fat lined the mists as they settled over the district's balconies, proving that nothing touching the worm pile could ever remain pure. Fortunately, this gloom was barely visible from behind arched temple windows as Laren's uncle and priest Hedrick 
held their usual standoff over how much premium ale to order for the night. Only eight flagons, Akul sputtered, his incredulous expression a tired act. Akul's smooth dome was shiny with sweat, adding to a sheen to the fat rolls at the back of his neck. The scar running from ear to nose was bright red, and he towered over Kedrick in false menace. Remind me again, when you refer to your flock, do you mean an actual flock of birds? Save your indignation for the man who last shaved your melon, Kedrick said, scratching both stubbly chins. He rested a hand on the ample belly beneath his robe. Do you know how much blue flower ale costs to make? They pay for blue flower, unlike the other swill you serve. Not enough, as you know. The barley has to be imported from... Kinech! Laren yelled. Both men whirled around and stared. Laren shuffled his feet, stepped forward, and pumped a clenched fist into the air. Aklad Varhusen! Akul blinked. He rubbed the back of his head. What say you, little one? Laren stared wide-eyed at his uncle's vast baldness, still shaken by the seizure that had just roared through him. Scalding liquid ran through his veins, its hot rush threatening to burst through his forehead. At four years old, he had no idea what had just happened, and the shocked looks of the two men only made it worse. A deathly quiet hung in the oak hallway, marred only by the muffled sound of prayers from another room. Floor-to-ceiling murals depicted the god Emja astride his chariot, his red mustache flowing in the wind, his eyes glowering down at Laren. By Emja's name, those words sound familiar, Kedrick said finally, bending down to envelop Laren in a cloud of alcohol vapor. Laren held his breath, watching with fascination as the priest's pupils dilated until they seemed to occupy his whole grizzled face. After a moment in which he almost toppled over, Kedrick blinked and straightened up. Beh. I'm late for lunch prayers. With that, he shuffled away, leaving them alone beneath Emja's red eyebrows of furious glare. Laren moved closer to Akul, who squinted at the priest's retreating back. Sprite, Akul said, I have a feeling we just got very lucky today. And so it was that Laren narrowly avoided a very different childhood. It took some time before he understood why his outburst made Akul so nervous. In those early years, all he knew was that the activities of other temple children weren't for him. At five, he began reading and math lessons in an isolated prayer room, studying at the hands of the half-crazed, roving-eyed priest Cyril. Cyril was the only man Akul trusted to keep quiet about Laren's outbursts, even if Laren knew that that trust was bought by silver with every handshake. At six, Akul found him a job cleaning offerings to Emja in an isolated temple storeroom, where his outbursts could be swallowed by thick walls and shelves of knickknacks. By the time he turned seven, he'd grown so bored polishing her cherry wood boxes and brass bowls, he thought he'd run screaming from the worm pile until some imperial guardsman smashed the butt of his halberd against his skull. Instead, one day, he decided to steal upstairs to the temple library, where ship-sized priest Tuin watched the door from his chair while eating enormous sandwiches and leafing through sick tomes. The books are for priesthood, not seven-year-old boys, Tuin said between chews raising a massive arm to block Laren's entrance to the library. He swallowed and stared from beneath sweaty brows. What do you want up here anyway? You should be playing with the other boys, not reading dead history. Not much to do around here, and I can't leave these four blocks, Laren pouted. Two in tapped one fleshy cheek. I suppose Akul does have you boxed into this little patch of cobblestone. Do Oral's Cretans really cause you so much mischief when you step into the rest of the worm pile? Laren shrugged, looking at his torn shoes. His uncle's solitary war against Oral's gang had mostly left him unaffected, especially since he spent most of his time inside Akul's oral-free zone. But as Akul's boy, his status outside those four blocks was always touchy. Anyway, he wasn't about to say anything that would make him seem less sympathetic. I just want to learn what you know. Tuin's gaze softened. Well, still, I don't think I'm supposed to let you in here. He shifted his enormous girth, provoking a terrible cracking noise from his chair. Maybe come back when you're a little older. I brought you this, Laren said, fishing the wrapped honey cookie from his pocket. Tuin glanced at the stairway entrance, then squinted at Laren. He took the cookie, removed the paper wrap, put the entire disc in his mouth, and looked down at his tome. Fine, he squelched, but stay away from the Lirashi scripts. Carver magic and ignorant boys do not mix. The library quickly became Laren's favorite spot in the temple. The morning lessons with Priest Cyril would begin in a state of sanity, but they would devolve by noon into a conversation between the priest and the alabaster statue in his lap. 
Laren tiptoed out during these times, listening to Cyril's excited tones fade into the solid oak walls. From there, he padded to the storeroom, where he polished just enough of Emja's offerings to keep Akul from grounding. After that, it was straight to the library, to immerse himself in dreams of faraway lands, divine battles, and mysterious legends of the deep. Laren developed a ritual whenever he stepped through the library's jade doorway. First, he'd issue a lighting spell on the vast crystal chandelier, although it always failed miserably outside the week of Apex. Then, beneath the unlit chandelier, he'd inhale the scent of cedar, eye the brilliant tapestry reliefs of the city of Aldive, gaze out the window overlooking the worm pile's grimy flat rooftops, and wait for two and snores. When the rumbles vibrated the cedar walls, Laren padded quietly to the section dealing with the ancient creatures known as carvers, whose Lirashi language was the foundation of the world's magic. He read about these godlike beings now long removed from the earth and the mysterious glyphs that had given humanity keys to their power. He memorized long violet sash spells that he had no hope of ever casting, marveling at the shape of the words on his tongue. When Tuin's snores were replaced by chewing, Laren kept to the religious poems on the theory that no self-respecting priest would scold him for reading scripture. Here he learned about the three monstrous forces that still ruled the world, the new gods, the old gods, and the demons, and the perpetual enmity between them. Under those vaulted ceilings, he read about the religions of all three, although the demons were only worshipped by one strange cannibal tribe called the Sudmen in the viney jungles of the southeast. And it was while reading about the Sudmen that he received his first clue as to who he was. In one passage, he came across the word Kinesh, which sounded very much like the beginning of his phrase. When he encountered the word Varusan a minute later, he felt the familiar sensation of spiders crawling up his spine. Burning liquid pulsed through his veins and a terrible heat throbbed in his forehead. He ground his teeth and gripped the table, but the fury was unstoppable. Laren shot to his feet, his chair scraping the floor. Kinech! Aklad! Varusan! He remained frozen as the outburst faded away, yearning to shrink into a tiny ball. Numbly, he gazed out the library's enormous window to where the flat rooftops of the worm pile blended into the bone-white squares of the port district in the distance. All of it shaded blue by the moon Spellgiver, which was now close enough to resolve its oceans and clouds. He looked out the window to where Spellgiver hung large in the heavens, then back at Laren. Laren nodded, looking down. So, Aaron, what just happened there? Uh, I sneeze really hard, Laren mumbled. Tuwin's mouth opened and then snapped shut, jiggling multiple chins. Laren, I hope whatever demon you expelled with that sneeze flies far from Neither Laren nor Tuwin knew just how close the priest had come to the truth. From that day forward, Laren vowed to do his reading beyond earshot of any priest. The next day, he slipped the library book into his bag, tiptoed past Tuwin's giant sleeping form, exited the temple, and then pushed through the chaos of shouting cart vendors and bargain hunters to reach the boundary of Akul's four-block zone. Breathing deeply, he lowered his head and stepped into the wider worm pile, where the alley corners were lined with trash. This was Oral's turf, a place as different from Akul's four-block zone as porridge and chimney soot. He snuck through abandoned courtyards and empty alleyways until he reached Madame Shembri's brothel at the boundary of the port district. To Laren, the port district existed in a completely different plane than the worm pile's dog pile of dirty alleyways. The port's square, brilliant, bright buildings sloped sharply down to the sea, traversed by winding streets that were impossible to descend without breaking into a run. The entire district rested on stone pillars, raising it above the high seas and tide, and the stench of seafood pervaded every corner. Laren soon found a sheltered alk above the bustle, with views of the district and the endless sea. Throughout this kaleidoscope of motion swaggered Sajuk, an enforcer for Oral's gang who was perpetually trailed by his two sycophants. Laren always thought enforcer was too strong a word for 18-year-old Sajuk, but backed by Oral slackjaws, he held the power to extort silver from any fish merchant selling into the worm pile. This portside robbery was then turned into a visible taunt as he stuck his coin pouch partway from his pocket and strutted through the port district like a king of thieves. Everyone knew Sajuk barely touched the silver before his master took it away. Laren learned to ignore Sajuk's terrible trio on his regular visits to the port district, casting eyes down whenever they glanced at him. This gesture of submission was really all Sajuk ever needed from anyone, and with that, Laren began focusing on his books. 
He'd been avoiding reading about the Sudman since his explosion in front of Tewin, but on this particular day, a book on those remote peoples intrigued him enough to try again. He pulled it from the library shelves, blew dust off the top, and scanned for any hint of the phrase. An hour later, he was reading chapter two as he leaned against a pillar high above the docks and saw that he'd missed something. That word can etch again. The heat rose behind his forehead and boiling liquid pulsed through his veins. After a desperate momentary internal battle, he dropped the book and raced into a rancid alley behind the cannery. There he pumped his fist, stomped his foot, and passed through every stage of his curse, shouting the phrase to high heavens. Hey, give that back, Laren yelled, running at Sajib. Laren began running towards Ajay. That's not my book, it's the temples. Give it back. Yet it flies so well, Ajay laughed, throwing the book back to Sajib. Laren heard the terrible sound of a page ripping which was the same sound his heart would make if the temple ever banished him from the library. He whirled around and ran to Sejak, who held the book high above his head. At eight years old, Laren had as much hope of reaching it as he did standing on Spellgiver. Give it back, Laren said, hating the pleading whine in his voice. And what if I don't, you little pus boil? What exactly are you going to do? If Laren had thought about it for an instant, he'd have lost his nerve. But everything happened too quickly for that. He yanked the coin pouch from Sejak's pocket, darted to Ajay's left, then raced down the hill to the docks, weaving around busy workers and jumping over the thick chains as Sajik and his crew bellowed behind him. You're going to die, you little insect, Sajik screamed, as they jumped over nets and pushed through crowds of workers. Nobody wanted to be seen resisting Oral's gang, but no one really wanted to help either. Burly dock workers moved slowly out of Sajik's way, giving Laren precious seconds. He flew over the cobblestones, swinging around port district pillars with one arm, jumping over piles of fish, and racing up another hill as a blur of gaping people passed through his vision. Finding himself out in the open, he darted into an alley, then realized it was a dead end. He scrambled out again, scraping grit off the brick wall into Ajay's eyes as the boy's fingers grasped Laren's shirt. Laren twisted away, hearing Ajay shout something unintelligible as he jumped over a giant crate of shrimp and swerved around a stand selling crab. From behind came a loud thud and crash as Sajik collided with the vendor. Laren burst from the market and after a panicked second, raced to the edge of the sewage canal parallel to the wooden fish market stalls, only 200 feet from where he'd started. He skidded to a stop and gasped desperately, staring at the brown ooze flowing from Aldive's richer district out to the sea. Hand shaking, he held the coin pouch out over the canal as Sajik's trio raced up the hill, their sandals slapping the cobblestones. They halted 20 feet away in a symphony of gasps, Sajik's eyes wide at his pouch's precarious position. You, he wheezed, you have exactly 10 seconds to give that back. His few chin hairs were dripping with sweat as he bent over, sucking air. Book, first, Laren said, gasping. You have made a giant mistake. You little shit, that's Oral's money. Think about what he'll do to you if you lose it. Laren stepped back, eyeing the gathering crowd. He turned back to Sajik. Think about what he'll do to you if you lose his money. Sajik's face paled. He opened his mouth to reply, but a sudden lull in the port district's buzz caused them both to swing around. There, bobbing above the newly installed fish market booths like a floating blowfish, was a cool bald dome. It floated purposely over the stalls, causing the stall owners to stop their conversations and watch nervously. Laren gaped. How had his uncle known he was here? Had one of Akul's contacts spotted him? Akul burst from the fish market like some scowling mountain troll, a shiny domed creature beset by scars and pointed instruments that jutted at every angle from a thick leather belt. He stopped in the plaza's center, the hilt of his backstrapped longsword shading a neighboring stall. Shielding his eyes with one hand, he spied Laren and began striding purposely uphill towards him. Laren was still too young to fully grasp who his uncle was, and he didn't understand why all motion stopped as Akul stomped up the hill. He knew about his uncle's war with Oral, of course, yet until that moment, he'd never realized just how intensely everyone followed this local battle. Akul's jaw unclenched, clenched, and then unclenched again, as if he was manually trying to hammer his face into a more pleasant expression. Sprite, he said finally, it's time to return to the temple. Laren's heart sank. Well, maybe today, but no, permanent. You need to do something a little less public. Laren's chin quivered. He knew exactly what wasn't being said his forsaken outbursts again. Never mind that today was his first one in three weeks at the port district. Never mind that he'd go crazy living in a cool four-block zone the rest of his life. 
For the first time, Laren felt his curse settle into his bone, wrap around his chest like a thorn tunic. He started pouting, though he knew it would get him nowhere. I can't leave yet, he said petulantly. At this, his gaze flickered towards Sajak, who watched the exchange with wide eyes. Akul twisted to consider Sajak. His hard stare traveled from Sajak's pale face down his trembling arm and to the book in his hands. Then he glanced at Laren's coin pouch dangling over the canal. His mouth twitched, the closest thing to a smile Laren ever saw in his uncle. The book, Akul said to Sajak, his hand outstretched. Sajak looked like he needed new breeches. His eyes flicked up and down the bristling mobile armory that was Akul. Saying nothing, he gave him the book. Akul nodded to Laren, and with enormous relief, Laren traded the pouch for his book. Akul turned to Sajak, dangling the pouch at eye level. This is Oral's money, is it? Sajak folded his arm. That's right. Oral will be very unhappy if any part of it goes missing. Good. With that, Akul opened the sack, scooped the pile of coins, and threw them to the watching crowds amid Sajak's horrified yell. A mad scramble ensued as the port workers dove for the silver in a frenzy. It wasn't often that Oral's crew got stiff. Come on, Laren, Akul growled. He whirled around and stomped down towards the fish market, completely unconcerned by Oral's three armed henchmen at his back. Laren raced to catch up with his uncle, his stomach twisting into triple knots. The war between Akul and Oral had just gotten more personal, and now he was a field mouse between two armies. As they reached the corner, Laren twisted to see Sajak's desolate face. Sajak's eyes held no animosity, no desire for revenge, only anguish. In that moment, neither could Laren muster any satisfaction at a bully's comeuppance. Instead, he was filled with an odd kind of sorrow and a peculiar sense of doom. He never saw Sajak again. So first question out the gate, and you've probably heard this a thousand times already. Do people call you Captain America? <laughs> yes, they do. And, uh, and I always remind them that Captain America spells his name wrong. Yeah. I've got a D in mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the D. That's the difference. You even mentioned in one of, the, one of my reviews on Amazon. I only asked because I know your passion for sci-fi and fantasy, and it shows within your novel. How long was this story floating around in your head before you finally wrote it all out? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, to be honest, actually, it started when I was a teenager. Uh, You know, like a lot of teenagers, I played Dungeons and Dragons. And I I actually started a book based on a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And then I decided, you know what, that's too cliche. And I stopped it. I started the first writings of, of this book, which was at the time called Morphat. And then, you know, and I was really into it for a while. And I put it down. And I didn't really start writing again until my 40s. And um, when I did, I, I looked at what I had written before and I scrapped every single word because you don't, I think most people at 18 are, don't have the life chops to really be you know, a good writer. But, um, but I kept some of the concepts. Um, and so I would say that the story has been circling around my head for many, many decades, <laughs> or a few hmm. decades anyway. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, the world you've created is really, really intricate. And we discover it through the experiences of this 16-year-old boy named Laren, who has some pretty interesting impulses. Who is this kid? And how has he survived all this time in a world as divided as Spellgiver, especially being as different as he is? Yeah, well, a lot of that, a lot of the way he survived, I mean, um, He's managed to, his uncle has known something is up with those outbursts. He didn't really know what it is, but he knew that it wasn't good. And so he kept Laren hidden. And so that's how he sort of survived for a while, just mm-hmm. by, by keeping the outburst hidden, which meant also that he was lonely. And that, that loneliness follows him throughout the book yeah. uh, because he was never really allowed to have friends like, like other kids. Um, and then... Later, we'll see, you know, in the, in the few subsequent chapters that, uh, you know, when he hits 11 or 12 or, uh, you know, his outburst, he can't control it. And it actually happens in front of other people. And that's when his loneliness becomes even more severe because then he starts, the, the gangs start beating him. And that's when, uh, you know, he has to start staying within a cool four block zone because he gets beaten when he's outside. Now, he has friends. He has a couple friends, but they're, you know, uh, one of them is an adult priestess and the other one is, is a kid his age who seems to not care that the gangs don't like Laren. 
Yeah, I was wondering about that with his uncle being such a tough guy, if uh, that had anything to do with it as well. But now I, I kind of see that it was the uncle who, I guess, in his own way, was protecting Laren. That's right. Akul was protecting Laren and, and, you know, keeping him from the worst of the beatings. He can't really stop the occasional beating, but, you know, he makes sure that that everyone knows that if they harm Laren more than more than a certain amount, like break a bone or something, he's going to he's going to go after them. And mm. so that happens a couple times in the book. Was it difficult writing Laren? Yeah. Well, you know, I think we've all experienced loneliness, you know, at some time in our life. So, you know, I pull the real emotions from from real places. His willingness to fight, he doesn't have he's not good with a sword like his uncle at pull. He'll have other he'll have other talents, as we'll see later in the book. But um, but his his propensity to fight back and to not be bullied. That comes from his uncle. I hope this isn't uh, a spoiler or giving things away, but we can't talk about fantasy without talking about magic as well and you have an interesting way of using magic within the story which involves the moon (laughs) like what's going on with that what's that about yeah the name of the series spellgiver is actually the name of the moon and the Mm. moon is the bringer of all magic you can imagine that the moon is in an elliptical orbit around the planet so it so it has some times where it's very close to the very close and very big in the sky and other times where it's merely a pinprick so magic is seasonal That's pretty amazing. You have a serious talent for detail, not only into the characters, but also into their culture. And in fact, it feels like the entire universe is still evolving. And perhaps City of Shards is just a snapshot of where they are right now. Yeah, I I think, you know, for me, every situation that I write about, I try to put myself in that situation and imagine how I would be whichever character I'm writing. Because Laren isn't the only point of view character, although he's the main one. So I, I always try to just imagine myself in that situation. And at the same time, I try to, you know, I've built up this world with different things like Apex and, and the way the magic works and everything. And and if you expand from there, you can think of what kind of holidays, what kind of what would the religions be like in this world? You know, what would they focus on? And, you know, you have the, the three classes, you know, the world is split into uh a triangle of enmity, you know, with the old gods on one corner, sometimes called the six-legged gods, uh, the human gods on one corner, and the demons on a third corner. So how does that affect the religions of the world? And and how does that interact with Apex and Nadir and the magic system? And, you know, if you if you kind of think through all those things, you get a, a kind of a web of complexity. And I think that a lot of a lot of what you think about, what I think about when I'm when I'm writing the book doesn't really make it into the book, but it serves as a background for uh what happens how do you keep it all together do you have or do you write from a source book or do you just have a wall just littered with like little sticky notes no i don't have anything like that i think you know honestly i think this book's in my head so for so long (laughs) you know i have been working on it for a while even in my adult life um and so i i think those those a lot of those details have cemented into my head you know how things work and who where various things are. I, I think if, if I was trying to write a little bit faster, um, I probably would need sticky notes. Um, well, I think it's important to also note how much effort went into the creation of your books, you know, over the years. You spent a lot of time thinking about the history and about the politics and how magic is used within the world. And in fact, didn't you even hire a cartographer to design the city maps that are in the book? I did. Yes. Yes. So I have a, I have two maps, actually. I have a, a city map, as you said, to show where Laren grows up. So most of book one is really spent in the city. And so I, I felt a good detailed city map was important there. And then most of book two is actually traveling as a journey. And so there I needed a good empire map, but it was good to have the empire map even for book one. And I, I really appreciated the uh, the maps that you had within the story. And those are the little details that add texture to the story, which makes a good story. Great. Also, authenticity. You have some hardcore right. readers that will take note of where these locations are. And if <laughs> you aren't accurate, they will definitely send you a letter or an email to That's tell right. you about it. That's right. I also noticed that you purposely stayed away from those traditional fantasy tropes such as elves and orcs. And you've created your own species that are unique to this universe. Yeah, one thing I didn't mention, I we talked about the magic and everything. So one of the the central fault line, actually, I think it is the fault line in in, in these books, is the the clash between um, the what what they call the four legged creatures and the six legged creatures. 
six-legged creatures are, are called indigen. So the, the name will imply that they were here first. And so how did humanity get there? Well, that's one of the mysteries of the books. But, but basically, so there are two classes of creatures. And the, the indigen creatures are, tend to have six legs. They, uh, they're, they, they look very different. They, they tend to have orbs that, um, that can function for both hearing or vision. And so they can, they can switch between those two at various uh, intensities. Um, and they also project emotion. And the indigen, you know, are, are you know, just like the four-legged creatures, most of them are animals. It's like most of the four-legged creatures are animals. But like the four-legged creatures, there's one sapient species. Um, so in the four-legged, it's us, it's humans. And in the six-legged, it's, it's called the Lidathi. Mm. And they, um, they have been, the, the battle between them and the humans is one of the fault lines in this book. And there you start touching into the socio-political aspects of the book because you have these six-legged creatures and, you know, the deities that they believe in and kind of in the simplest form, the conflict of we were here first, get out. Right, and, right, exactly. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the POV characters uh, in the book is not even human. So uh, it's, a, it's a creature named Kemharak, who is the leader, he's the general of uh of the indigen the, the lidathi who is the sapient indigen species and his his mission is to steal back what was stolen from him that what he feels was stolen from him by the humans how do you keep yourself from getting lost within this world that you've created and and what i mean is <laughs> like when you're working on these stories do you find that like just hours disappear from your day? Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's really, yeah, that's really true. And I think probably a lot of writers have, have similar experience, but you know, um, and I have to say that by writing book three is a little bit easier task than the first ones because the, the world has been established I and mean, I'm still coming up with brand new things that we haven't seen before, but it's all within the framework of the world. Yeah. And that's pretty common for things, as you mentioned, to get easier um, because the more experience you have as a writer, you kind of develop your own process and your own style. And like you said, the story and the That's universe right. is already is already built. OK, right on. Right on. Cool. Is there anything yeah. else that you wanted to discuss or anything that I may have missed? Um, well, I would just say that um, for people who are reading my books, that uh, book three so there's a, a lot of these mysteries of the world that I've introduced, you know, like the, who are the carvers? How did humanity get where it is? And how does magic work? And what's the history of it? So, uh, and, and I've given hints throughout book one and book two. And I will say that uh, the, the series is going to be four books. I'm writing book three now. And uh, the last two books will explore some of those mysteries. And, and, you know, most a lot of the answers will be given. So my last question where can readers go to learn more about you and your works? So www.steverogersauthor.com and Rogers is spelled with a D. That's my website. And of course, you can look up on Amazon my books. Uh, the first book is City of Shards. And the second one is called In the Claws of the Indigen. And is the second book I'm out sorry. already? I know the first one just came out in April. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the first one came out in April. The second one came out in May because I... Uh, I would sound strange, but actually, as I had said earlier, that you know, I, I wrote, I wrote it as one big book, and for a long time, it was one big book, and then I just split it up, and then I made sure it was all ready as as two books, and then I released one, and I released the second one in the month later. And with that, we're going to wrap up another episode. Thanks again to Steve for speaking with us today. If you have any questions for him or for me. Or you know an author who you think would be a good fit for the show? Let me know. Connect with me on social media. You know where I am. <laughs> or send an email to info at ch1podcast.com. Check out ch1podcast.com, where there you can listen to previous episodes and hopefully find your next favorite author. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overcast, basically wherever podcasts can be downloaded don't forget to leave us a five-star review and most importantly tell everyone you know about the show and a big 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 thank you to everyone who has subscribed and for those who have helped to spread the word and for those who message me every week i know it takes a long time for me to respond but i do respond to everything so okay i'm going to leave it there that's it for me you all stay awesome Till next time